Hey kids, today I'm going to be covering the Vulgate cycle and some of the major characters in Athurian legend. So I'll be reading to you about a lot of the knights that make that made up the Knights of the Round Table. Um, the Vulgate cycle is a major source of Athurian legend um, that was written in French. It is a series of five prose volumes that tell the story of the quest for the Holy Grail, which you should have read by now. It was in day one of Athurian legend content. And uh, you should also know about the romance of Lancelot and Queen Guinevere, which if you don't, I will be covering that today as well. The major parts of these stories are from early 13th century. The Vulgate cycle adds an intriguing dimension to the King Arthur tradition, perpetuating Christian themes by expanding on tales of the Holy Grail and then recounting the quests of this grail and who went on those quests. There were several knights that were said to go on the quest for the Holy Grail, and those knights had to be very pure, by the way. Um, during this period, material takes on even more historical and religious overtones with tales that include and deal both in the death of Arthur and Merlin. Um, the Vulgate cycle combines elements of Old Testament with the birth of Merlin, whose magical origins are consistent with those told by uh, author by the name of Robert de Baron. Um, Merlin was known as the son of a devil and a human mother who repents her sins and is then baptized. Merlin is transformed into a prophet and then given the ability of seeing future events by God. The Vulgate cycle was subject to the 13th century revision in which much was left out and then much added. There's something that's called the post-Vulgate cycle. Uh, let's talk about Galahad, Lancelot, and Gawain. Sir Gawain is my favorite knight of the King Arthur's knights. Um, you should have by now read Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and Sir Gawain and the Loathly Lady. There's two videos that are uploaded that, of me reading them aloud if you didn't feel like reading them. So, um, Lancelot was uh, Galahad's father. All of these knights were said to go on the Grail quest, including, that's not on here, Percival, but only one was able to obtain it because of his uh, virtuous and purity, and that was Sir Galahad. Guinevere, Queen Guinevere, she was the queen of the Bretons. Her symbols were gold, silver, and bronze. She grieved for Arthur while he was on his Holy Grail quest, and she had an affair with Sir Lancelot that caused the downfall, basically, of the Bretons. So um, there's a little tr love triangle that happens here. Uh, queen Guinevere, uh, King Arthur was her husband, Sir Lancelot, her lover, formed the most celebrated love triangle in European literature. Her origins were probably Welsh. Um, her presence runs strong throughout the mainstream Arthurian legend. In the author uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, Historia Regimen Brittonae, in the works of the French poet uh, Christian de Troyes, and then Robert de Baron, the author, and then in the Vulgate Cycle, and then you'll see her again in Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort de Arthur. Those are all the, the writers of King Arthur and the legend behind it. According to Geoffrey of Monmouth, Guinevere is descended from a noble family of Romans, and she's known as the loveliest woman in all the island. In later romances, she is known as the daughter of Leo de Grants, who was the previous owner of the round table that's famous. Um, she brings with this table and 100 knights um, to King Arthur as her dowry to marry. Um, by the time uh, the poet Christian de Torres wrote of her affair with Lancelot, it's well established. It is he, Lancelot, not Arthur, who rescues Guinevere from her abductor, Maligant. Um, she is an accomplice to Mordred's treachery against Arthur in the Vulgate cycle. And then in Thomas de Mallory's Le, Le Mort, Mort de Arthur, where Queen Guinevere's character comes to full fruition. Here, her lifelong relationship with Lancelot, who rescues her from being burnt at the stake for adultery, eventually brings about the downfall of all of Camelot. So, Queen Guinevere. Merlin. Merlin was known as a druid priest. He was a mystical assistant to King Arthur. He was the advisor to the king and the knights of the round table, and he was also one of the ones that warned King Arthur about his downfall 
that would be at the hands of Mordred. Um, Merlin was believed to be a seer or prophet by some, enchanted with magical powers, or just a wise man by others. His legend probably originated in the 500s and then was embellished through time. Merlin made his first appearance in literature in the early 12th century in Prophecies of Merlin that was written by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Monmouth based his Merlin on a legend who was called Mirrodin. Merlin is credited with helping to establish the famous round table where all of King Arthur's knights sat, and he played a major role in the mysteries of the Holy Grail. Merlin also received credit for being responsible for the moving of Stonehenge, which was then known as the Giant's Ring. He moved it from Mount Calaris in Ireland to its current place in Salisbury Plain. Merlin supposedly moved Stonehenge for two reasons. Uh, one was for the stones to be a monument to those who had died in battle with the Saxons. The second reason was because the stones possessed great powers of healing. Sir Thomas Mallory, in his writings in Le Mort de Arthur, represents Merlin as being an advisor to King Arthur. And then Alfred Lord, Lord Tennyson, in his writings, uh, portrays Merlin as an architect of Camelot. Merlin's mother's name was Alden, and his father was supposedly a devil. Uh, Merlin, during his lifetime, turned his back on evil and dark forces to turn to the power of light and goodness. Now, when Merlin was young, Vortigen, the king of Britain, wanted to build a tower near Mount Sidonia in Wales. The tower kept collapsing without apparent reason every night, and it was determined that a fatherless child needed to be sacrificed to remedy this problem. Merlin was then brought forward. The youth told the king's advisors then that the reason for the tower collapsing was due to the existence of a pool that was beneath the foundation. And so they dug beneath this tower and this proved to be true. And uh, two dragons, one white and one red, then emerged. <laughs> The two dragons supposedly symbolized the constant fighting between the Saxons and the Bretons. Uh, the two dragons began to fight. The white dragon kills the red dragon. Hence, Merlin prophesied Fortigen's death by Euralius and the future of the land. Merlin became an important figure in the reign of three later kings, Euralius, Uther, who is King Arthur's father, and then King Arthur himself. When Uther Pendragon, King Arthur's father, became king, Merlin arranged for him to seduce Igraine by making Uther magically take on the appearance of her husband. Kind of sounds like Zeus. Um, a child then was born. This would be King Arthur. And Merlin takes the child away after his birth. Uh, Merlin educated Arthur, and he keeps him safe. When Uther was near death, Merlin arranged for the sword and the stone contest where Arthur could withdraw the sword from the stone and then be recognized as the next king. When Arthur became king, Merlin helped him acquire the infamous round table and then helped Arthur set up his knightly order. Um, Nimu, she was also known as many other names, Vivian, uh, Lady of the Lake. Um, there seems to be more than one Lady of the Lake, but in Thomas Mallory's Mort de Arthur story, Nimu is responsible for Merlin's downfall. Nimu's father was Dionys, a landowner, but is less than a baron, by the way. She met Merlin. Nimu met Merlin when she was 16 years of age, and Merlin fell instantly in love with her. He was so in love with her that he was constantly at her side, and uh, Nimu accompanied Merlin on many journeys so that she might learn his magic. Knowing that Merlin could take her unwillingly, she made him swear that he would use no magic to make her lay with him. And as they traveled, Nimu became more and more afraid of Merlin's advances. Um, in some versions of this legend, Nimu traded her love for lessons in sorcery. Merlin did foresee his death, but he was so smitten by her that he was helpless to avert his own tragic end. There are different versions of, of Merlin's death. One is that Nimu was tired of him, and so she turned one of his own spells against him and seals him in a cave forever. Another version has her trapping him in a hawthorn tree where his voice is sometimes heard. 
and some other tales have him living forever in his confinement, and other tell of his death and his dissension into madness. So, anyways, after Merlin's imprisonment, Nimu takes on the aspect of being King Arthur's advisor and counselor, and she then becomes the lover of Sir Peleus, who is one of King Arthur's knights, and she marries Sir Peleus. Elias, maybe Peleus. Mordred, ooh, Mordred. Um, we are told that Arthur and Mordrish Paris at the parish, excuse me, at the Battle of Camelon, but we're not told that they were on different sides. Uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth informs us that Mordred was King Arthur's nephew, um, the son of Arthur's sister Anna and her husband, some guy named Lot. Uh, the dream of Ronneby makes him Arthur's foster son as well as his nephew. nephew. Um, Geoffrey asserts that when Arthur was away on his Roman campaign, Mordred seized Queen Guinevere and the throne, thus paving the way for their final battle. Um, another author claims that Mordred survived this battle only to be defeated by Lancelot, who executed Guinevere. Doubtless because he thought she had willingly complied in being seized and then incarc incarcerated Mordred with her dead body, which Mordred ate before dying of starvation. Isn't that a wonderful story? Um, there is an incest motif in the story of Mordred's birth. The earliest occurrence is in Mort de Arthur by Thomas Mallory. In Mallory's version, Arthur slept with his half-sister uh, Morgane, or Morgase, not knowing who that they were related because she was disguised, by the way, which I will cover a little bit later. Uh, Mordred was then born. When Arthur discovered the whole truth in an attempt to kill Mordred, he had all children born on the day of Mordred's birth set adrift. So again, there you go, boys being sent to drown because of fear of being overtaken. The ship carried Mordred was wrecked, though, and he survived and was fostered by a person named Nabor. As an adult, Mordred became one of Arthur's knights, and he was for a time a companion of Lancelot. He took the part of the Orkney family against the family of Pelennor, slaying Pelennor's son. When Arthur went to fight Lancelot later, Mordred was, Mordred was left in regent in his absence, and he proclaimed that Arthur was dead and then laid siege to Guinevere in the throne. In Wace, Mordred is not Arthur's son. This is another writer, Wace. Uh, but Guinevere, whom he seized and made his queen, was his sister. So there's just different alternate versions depending on what story, what author you're reading on who was who, as you can see by Merlin and Mordred. Morgan Le Fay. Okay. Morgan Le Fay is popularly, popularly known as the Arthurian Sorceress. She's known as a fairy, a priestess, a dark magi magician, an enchantress, a witch, a sea goddess, a shapeshifter, and a healer. Um, she's the daughter of Egrain and Glorlius, who is the half-sister to King Arthur and mother of Mordred. Um, Mor Morgan Le Fay was first introduced into Arthurian legend by Geoffrey of Monmouth. And um, her true origin, as with many Arthurian characters, lead back into Celtic mythology and inevitably develop with each new tale. So they're introduced a long time ago in the Celtic mythology, but then their stories are embellished by different types of authors. So it makes you wonder, are the theories of King Arthur and the legend behind it true or not? Um, where was I? So the name Morgan Le Fay means in Celtic terms, um, well, no, it doesn't mean anything, but wait, she's also, she coincides with the goddess Morgan, who I introduced in the Celtic culture, the goddess of death, the goddess of the underworld, my favorite goddess Morgan. Um, so they could be one in the same character, Morgan Le Fay, Morgase, Morgane. So you'll see her name in different stories in different forms, but typically the same person. According to Celtic tradition, the Morgan, a triple goddess, thought to be the goddess of death, flew over battle, shrieking like ravens and claiming the dead soldiers' heads as trophies. The Welsh and Athurian storylines were later merged, forming a link between Modern and King Arthur. 
Um, the 6th century ruler called Urin presided over loose collations of kings. Um, he was a loose ally. Lefay, oh, here it goes. Lefay, her, her name Lefay, an ancient word for fairy. And to this day, the Breton name for a water nymph is Morgan. The possible roots of the Arthurian character Morgan Le Fay therefore run deep into British mythology and can be traced across several hundred years up to her final act as one of the three women who transports the fatally wounded King Arthur in a barge to the Isle of Avalon to be healed. Um, a speculative summary based on Welsh and other Thorian legends suggests that the identification of Modron and also the river goddess Matrana possibly derived from the Irish goddess Morgan. Given the um, superstitious Christian attitude towards supernatural women in the medieval era, the more she's humanized, the more the name Morgan Le Fay descends into easy literary metaphor for devious and sometimes uh, evil mischief. Nonetheless, the much maligned Morgan Le Fay never becomes purely evil. Her attractive qualities remain. She's a healer, and she's also associated with art and culture. So, that's Morgan Le Fay, King Arthur's half-sister. She was jealous of Arthur's kingship, and she ends up tricking him to have a son, and they have Mordred, who ends up being another downfall of King Arthur. Queen Maeve, um, you might remember, uh, recall Queen Maeve from the Celtic culture story, The, the Cattle Raid of Cooley. She's the jealous wife um, who wants everything that her husband has. He happens to have a, I think he had a white bull, and so she wanted a bull too, and she ends up going through all this battles and cattle raids to uh, get, achieve the brown bull, who then ends up fighting the white bull, and they end up killing each other, I believe. <laughs> so, if you remember Queen Maeve, she has the gift of prophecy. She was the one that uh, warned Kukulan of his fate, um, she wanted to ensure that Mordred, King Arthur's son, would fulfill his destiny and overthrow his father. So she was not necessarily a good character in the King Arthur legends. Hector K. and Bevedere. Um, I'm going to first talk about K. because he's the son of Sir Hector. Um, Hector and K. were involved in Merlin's upbringing. Sir K. was the son of Hector and the foster brother of King Arthur. History, history records Kay as being a very tall man. In fact, he was known as the tall. Um, he appears in several stories. Uh, at times, he is volatile and has a cruel nature, but he was known as Arthur Stewart, so his right-hand man, per se. And he was one of his most faithful companions. King Arthur could really trust Sir Kay. Um, some sources say that Kay was a Saxon, and there are different accounts of uh, Sir Kay's death. So throughout Welsh literature, it is claimed that he was killed by Gowie Dag, who was in turn killed by King Arthur, but it is also said that he could have been killed by the Romans, or he might have been killed in the war against Mordred that happens. So that's Sir Kay. Um, Sir Bevedere. Bevedere was asked by Arthur to get rid of the sword Excalibur, and Bevedere ends up trying to throw Excalibur into the lake three different times. Um, Sir Bevedere was a trusty supporter of King Arthur from the beginning of his reign, and he was one of the first knights to join the Fellowship of the Round Table. Sir Bevedere helped Arthur fight the giant of Mont St. Michael, and he later was made Duke of Neustria. Bevedere had only one hand later in life, having lost one of his hands in a battle. He had a son called Amran and a daughter named Univok. <laughs> Bevedere was present at the last battle, the fateful battle of Camlon. Um, he and Arthur alone survived this battle, and he was given the command by Arthur to throw uh, Excalibur back into the lake. After lying twice to Arthur that he did do this, he finally tosses the precious sword into the lake. The hand of the Lady of the Lake comes up and retrieves the sword back to its watery home. The name Bevedere comes from, a, from the Welsh. Um, his grandfather was also named Bevedere. So Bevedere was, uh, ended up being killed in the Roman campaign when the Romans attacked. Sir Lancelot, one of the interesting 
characters of King Arthur and the legend. Feel free to pause the video if you feel like you've had enough of the knights today and come back to this video tomorrow. Um, Lancelot was the son of King Bane of Benwick and Queen Elaine. He was the first knight of the round table and he never failed in his gentleness, his courtesy and courage. He was also a knight who was very willing to serve others. It has been said that Lancelot was the greatest fighter and swordsman of all the knights of the round table. Legend tells us that as a child, Lancelot was left by the shore of the lake where he was found then by Vivian, the Lady of the Lake, or maybe Numu. Uh, she fostered and raised him, and in time, Lancelot became one of history's greatest knights. I'm sure you've heard of Sir Lancelot. Uh, legend also says that Lancelot was the father of Galahad by Elaine. Now, this was a different Elaine than his mother, um, who died of a broken heart because Lancelot did not return her love and affection. Uh, many sources tell us of the love shared toward each other of Lancelot and Queen Guinevere. Queen Guinevere was King Arthur's wife, if you haven't already figured that out. Uh, there may be some truth to this since Lancelot was a favorite of the Queen's and he did rescue her from the stake on two different occasions. She was going to be burned at the stake. It was at one of these rescues that Lancelot mistakenly kills Sir Gareth which then led to the whole disbandment, the whole ruin of the round table. After the queen repented to an abbey as a nun, Lancelot lived the rest of his life as a hermit. So, the question remains, did Lancelot originate in Celtic mythology? Was he a continental invention? Or did he really live as a famous knight and hero? We may never know but Lancelot will always live in our imaginations as one of the greatest knights in history. Take note that Duloc is after his name on the slide here, Lancelot Duloc, and that's uh, Lancelot of the Lake, since he was found by the Lady of the Lake. Sir Tristan. Um, Tristan was a contemporary of King Arthur, and he was a knight of the Round Table. He was the nephew and champion of King Mark of Cornwall. Um, he was the son of Melodus, who was king of Lyonis. Tristan's mother died when he was born, and as a young man, he took service with his uncle, uh, his uncle Mark. So King Mark of Cornwall ended up raising Tristan. Tristan became the champion of his uncle after defeating and killing uh, Maras of Ireland in a duel. This defeat leads to a truce with King Anguish of Ireland, and he then arranges for his daughter Isolde to be married to King Mark. It was Tristan who was sent by his uncle to Ireland to fetch this would-be queen, and while in the process of bringing her back to Cornwall, guess what? Tristan and Isolde fall deeply and helplessly in love with each other, and therefore they fled from Mark and they lived the rest of their days on the run. Legend has it that while Tristan was playing his harp for Isolde, Mark sneaks in behind and kills him with a dagger or lance in the back. Um, the name Tristan may be Pickish in origin. So there is, I know there's a modern day movie, I think it's called Tristan and Isolde, I could be wrong. I don't know, a good decade, maybe two decades old, but there is a little romance out, movie out there about Tristan and Isolde. And we will finish up with Sir Bors today. Sir Bors was the favorite cousin of Sir Lancelot, and he was the son of King Bors of Gaines and Queen Yvain. After the death of King Bors at the hand of King Claudus, his young son, Bors the Younger, who had nominally succeeded as king, and Lionel were then taken into captivity. They were, however, rescued um, by a high priestess of the Lady of the Lake, to whom she entrusted their care, and they were thus brought up with their cousin, Lancelot. Excuse me. Bors traveled to King Arthur's court with Lancelot, along with Gawain and Bedivere. He acted as a messenger between King Arthur and his imperial Roman enemy. So... He was a messenger for King Arthur. Um, he becomes a central figure in the King, King's European campaign 
as Arthur's personal guard, and he became a great warrior, wielding Duke Galhalt's sword, and easily he was recognized by um, a distinctive scar on his forehead. So, there you go. Those are some of the major characters in the King Arthur period, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Please like my video if you did. Thank you.